So we're going to take a look at the Amiga real-time clock and specifically the Amiga 1200 real-time clock. I know it sounds a bit boring, but bear with me. Um, for those who don't know, a real-time clock, all it is is you set the time in your computer and it's something that remembers the time. So after you've set the time, if you turn your computer off, then turn it back on again, it remembers the time or remembers the correct time as it is now. And that's all a real-time clock is. The computer itself can keep time, but it can't remember it when the computer's off. So that's what the real-time clock system does. Now, here's a picture of my Amiga 1200 motherboard. I think this is when I was recapping it. And if you take a look at the right-hand side here, and you zoom in a bit here, we'll notice that there's a giant section here that's just got all these pads for stuff, like chips and parts and stuff like that, but none of it's populated. Well, that section there is the section for the Amiga real-time clock. Uh, but in this case, they put all the parts for, on it for, on the motherboard, but they didn't actually populate any of them. So that may be a good thing and a bad thing because it's bad because it means you don't have a real-time clock in your Amiga, but it's good because there's no nickel cadmium battery sitting there that's going to leak and destroy your motherboard. But they actually went through all that trouble, but maybe, maybe they decided to save some money on that one and thought they just wouldn't put the parts on. And also notice we've got these two pin headers here that aren't populated. This is the RAM. Those four chips are on the left, by the way, are the RAM chips. And there are actually two pin headers there, and half of one pin header is populated. And we'll come back to why that is in a bit. So here's the actual schematic for the real-time clock. And notice it's optional. So they, they actually put all this schematic in, but they didn't actually install any of it. And that's all the stuff there next to it. And if we take a look, yeah, this U9 chip, the RF5C01A, which is the kind of the business end of the real-time clock, that's what would go there. And just to point out a few other parts, we've got a variable capacitor there, and it also needs a crystal oscillator. And this giant section here is actually the battery. So it needs a few diodes and some stuff to, to run the actual battery, uh, the rechargeable battery for the real-time clock. But none of it's there because they, on the MiG 1200, they just didn't install it. They decided to save a few pennies and up here for this chip, notice that we've actually got four address lines and four data lines that are going into the chip. So they're directly connected to the CPU. And that's this chip here, RF, RF5C01A at U9. And if we look at the data sheet for this chip, it says it's a real-time clock for microcomputers that can be connected directly to the buses of microcomputers with such CPUs as the AT, AT85A or ZAT to allow setting or reading of the clock with the same procedures for read-write operation for memory. So that's pretty cool. So it's basically saying you can just write software that can actually access this. And there it is, connect directly to the CPU. So that's with this 4-bit data bus and 4-bit address bus that you can see there. And we've just seen that on the schematic. And another thing of note is that the clock data is expressed in BCD codes, and BCD stands for binary coded decimal. So what it's basically going to say is that each digit in the clock is coming out um, as binary, but it's just one decimal digit. We'll come to that in a bit. So there's the actual package for what would have been installed on the Amiga. And there's the place where it's supposed to go at U9. And one of the first things you can see is that, well, this chip has got 18 pins and the board has got 20. So I don't exactly know what's going on here because it does appear to be that this is the right schematic for this, but I can't really tell. But there's two extra pins on this board and this, they're both not connected and they're kind of in the middle of the of the pin layout there. So don't quite understand. But other than that, the pins do match up. So maybe there's a different version of this chip or something. I'm not exactly sure. So that is the chip select line there that's connected to Gale that to, uh, needs to tell when the chip can turn on when you're accessing the, the correct memory address. These are the data lines. They're connected in the right place. D0 to D3 are connected. You've got four data lines. And there are four address lines um, here, but that not connected pin is in the middle of that. So really don't quite understand. Maybe there's a different version of this chip. Not sure. And worthy of note is that they didn't actually connect up A0 to A3 um, address lines. They connected up A2, A3, A4, A5. And that will become more apparent later as to why they've done that. I think they've done that because it's 32-bit uh, processor accessing, but it, it does change the way this is accessed. So it's perfectly valid to do that, but um, it's worth noting that now because that will come up later. Um, and they, here are the addresses. These are the 16 addresses in the chip. This column down the left has got... Uh, the yeah 16 addresses 
And what we've got here is we've got seconds. So remember, this is binary coded decimal. So we've got um, address zero. We can read the one second counter, and that's the one decimal digit and the 10 decimal digit. We've got the one minute counter and the 10 minute counter. So it's the decimal digits we're reading out. And we've got hours. We've got day of the week. Uh, we've got the day of, um, yes, yeah, so we've got the day of the month. We've got the month and we've got the year. And there's a few control registers after that. But notice we've only storing two digits for the year. We're storing the one year counter and the 10 year counter. So we can store like the last two digits of a year. We can't store four digits for a year. So that's interesting. And let's take a look at that. This is how you would get data out of this chip basically. So say you've turned the computer on and the computer needs to know what the time is because it's been reset. So let's say the real time clock's storing the thing, it's got the battery backed up and it knows the time is 10.36. So what you would do is you would read from address two and that would give you the one minute value. So that's going to return six. So that's the digit that goes in the in the minute place, uh, in the, yeah, in the one minute place. So yeah, that would come out as the four binary bits and you just convert that um, to your decimal digit. And if you read address three, that's going to give you the 10 minute value. So that's going to return a three. If we read the one hour digit at address four, that's going to return zero. And at the 10 hour digit at address five, that's going to return a one. And we've constructed our time of 1036. So we've, we've recovered the time from the real time clock and we can use that and just, you don't have to set it then because you're lazy. The computer's remembered it for you. Uh, but what about the year? Say the year was 1985, the year the Amiga was made. Well, you read from address B to get the one year digit, and that's going to return you a five. And then you read from address C, that's going to turn you the 10 year count, and that's going to return you an eight. Um, so where's the 19 coming from? Because we're not storing it. So there's no 100 year counter and there's no 1000 year counter. It just doesn't exist in this particular chip. So according to uh, this page, I found... Um, the Amiga OS uh, has an epoch, which is the value that it stores all times from. And it's like starting time is January the 1st, 1978 at midnight, basically. So it's a bit like what Unix does, but I think they go from 1970, but the Amiga goes from 1978. So the way they do it, they say, is that if this number is greater than or equal to 78, then we just add 1900 to it because we think it's in the 1900s. And otherwise, we're going to add 2000 to it because we think it's in the 2000s. So in this case, um, 85 is greater than or equal to 78. So we add 1900 to the 85 and we've recovered the year 1985. So it's not great. We're only storing two digits, but um, we've managed to recover our year correctly. But what happens if you set the year to 2079 and then do a full reboot? What's going to happen? So let's try that now. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to actually set the clock. Let's see, it's 2025. That's the correct year. I'm going to set it to 2079. I'm going to save that. And then we're going to reboot. And we're going to see what the time is or the year is. And the answer is it's 1979. There we go. As expected, it doesn't work. Now, also, if you want to access the real time clock, you can't actually access it at address zero and one and two and three. They could have mapped it there, but it's not. And actually, the real time clock is actually mapped at address DC 0000. So there you go. And the, the Amiga has reserved 64 kilobytes of address space just for that chip. So it's only got 16 actual addresses, but they've reserved 64 kilobytes in case they wanted to put a different chip in or whatever. So, and you'll see they do use more than the 16 um, bytes uh, at some point. So we'll see that in a minute. But that's the that's the starting address for the real-time clock, DC0000. So what you'd actually do is, if you wanted to read, say, the 10-second value, you wouldn't just read that from address 1. You'd read it from DC0000 plus 1, and that would give you the address of the 10-second counter. You read that, and then Gail knows that, oh, turn that chip on because we're reading a certain address, and it knows that to access the real-time clock. Um, but, and the, the but is, remember they didn't connect the address lines up from A0, they connected them up from A2. So in actual fact, everything's multiplied by four, all these addresses multiplied by four. So it's DC0000 plus four in this case, it's one times four. And there you go. 
And the same thing goes, if you want the one minute counter, it's actually 008 and that's 00C and so on and so on. So those addresses come out in that way because that's the way they map the pins in. And I think they've done that because it's a 32 bit CPU and it just makes it slightly easier to read. That's the only reason I could see them doing that, I think maybe. But seeing as I'm saying this actual chip probably doesn't work in Amiga because it's connected wrong. And I don't think anybody wants to solder anything onto the motherboard anyway. This is what I've actually got in mind. I've actually got, um, this came from Amiga kit and it's actually uh, a different real-time clock chip. It says RTC62423. And there's got a lot less parts on it. And that's because it doesn't actually need a rechargeable battery. So it doesn't need all that circuit circuitry for recharging because it's just got a coin cell. It's got a built-in crystal oscillator. So you don't need loads of extra circuitry for that. So it's a much simpler circuit. And it's built onto a little board that we can actually connect to the Amiga. So this is the chip they've actually used and it's not the same as the one that's on the board, but it is one that the Amiga OS understands. And it's got slightly different addresses. It works in a very similar way. You can see it's got 16 addresses, but they're in a slightly different order. So, and yeah, it's the weak register that's actually moved. That's up at like address six on the one that's specified on the board, but this one's actually um, at address C. So uh, Addresses are slightly different on this, but Amiga OS understands the difference between this and the other one because they've used both of them at some point. Notice that um, populated pin header down there, that's where you can actually put this actual real-time clock. And a lot of people call this the clock port, but actually it's not really a clock port. It's actually in the schematic, th this is just a memory expansion. This is where you would have been able to install more RAM, but in effect, all the RAM is already installed, the chip RAM, it's already got two megabytes, which is as much as the Amiga could take. So what they've done is they've populated some pins there that allow you to just pop on a real-time clock. But in fact, you could put anything on there because anything that can access the memory bus um, can actually be put there. So it could have been memory. In this case, it's a real-time clock. And there it is. So that's the section that they populated. It's even marked on the schematic. And notice that actually the real-time clock chip select line is actually sent over onto there as well. It's also sent to the expansion, trapdoor expansion as well. And that's so that you can actually install the real-time clock onto a memory expansion in the trapdoor as well. So if you didn't have that, you probably wouldn't be able to do it. But other than that, you just need address lines and stuff. Um, so how is it possible this different chip can work when it's not the one specified? And the answer is, is because it's a version of the chip that is used on the Amiga 500. This is from the Amiga 500 schematic from the add-on board where they use something called an MSM 6242B. And if we take a look at that, this one that's on the Amiga kit board is pin and function compatible with MSM 6242 series. So they've used a pin compatible chip with something that was already on the Amiga 500. So it's something Amiga OS understands and it's a much simpler chip because in this case, it doesn't need all that extra stuff. So let's take a look at some code and let's see if we can actually read some values out of this real time clock chip. So I'm in dev pack three on the Amiga and I've just written this little program so we can just actually uh, pull out in the debugger some of the values from the real-time clock. So what I've done here is I've just set up uh, a couple of the registers from the chip that I've got in this particular, this is an Amiga 1200 with the um, Amiga kit clock in it. And I've just got the registers for the control register. That's to turn, stop the clock from ticking while I'm using it. And I've just picked out the year one and the year 10 registers, and they would be at address D, A, and B. But remember, Commodore have like wired these up with not using the lowest address line. So you have to multiply all the values by four. So those are the actual like offset addresses to the registers in the chip. And it's actually offset from DC 0000. So if I take that address and then I actually add on the control register to it, then that's the address to the real time clock. So I should be able to like read in the value here. So what I'm doing here is I'm just like turning the, I'm stopping the ticking and then I'm reading the year one register uh, so I'm loading its address into A0 and then I'm loading it to Z0 and then I'm picking out the last four bits because remember this is only a four bit chip so there's a load of like rubbish on the address bus or whatever on the data bus so that will get discarded by that and so doing the same thing here with year 10 and then I just start the ticking again so if I just run this if I, I I'm just going to debug it so the output will just be in the debugger I'm going to run it until that read RTC start um, so here we are. So the actual address is DC0034. So that's actually the address of the control register. So if I just step over that, oops, 
I actually finished the program now. Let me start again. Here we go. It's control Z to step. It's a bit weird. So step over that. So that just stops the ticking. And then this one here is the year one register DC002A. I'm going to load the address of that into the A0 register up there. And then I'm going to read the value into D0. So you can see I've got a load of like garbage in D0 up here. FF05, FF5. But I'm only interested in the last four bits. So that's what this and with the F there is. That's just going to mask off the last four bits. And there it is. So I'm reading a five and it's 2025. So that is the that is the one digit from 2025. Now I'm going to read the the uh, tens digit. So that's address DC 002C. I'm going to load the address of that in, move that into the D0 register. Again, I get a load of garbage, but I mask off the last four bits. And there's my two for 2025. So I've got a five and I got a two. And then this one just starts the ticking up again. Uh, and that's it. So that's how I'm reading the real-time clock, just by using the CPU. I think that's that's pretty cool.